Well, surprise, surprise, I'm back. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> it's okay. And, uh, but what a surprise. Yes, uh, when I got the phone call yesterday, I said, yes, I'll get something together and uh, help. And I think, I hope and pray it, it is the best way. So let's uh, open your Bibles, though. You can get them ready. Uh, we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So I'm going to be reading verses from there. But uh, let me begin with a, a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just come and before you now, and I just pray that your words will come forth to us and encourage us and show us the way of life with you. And I just ask, O oh Jesus, that we see you in all your glory and your many benefits and blessings and grace and love to us. So come now in the power of your spirit, as you've been with us already in this service, continue, lead us, guide us. For all who are going to be watching, Lord, at home, be with them as well. Bless them and touch them. There is much fear and anxiety in our world these days, and we need you more than ever. Come now and speak your word to us, I pray. Amen. Amen. So how do you know it's going to be a bad day? Well, as one cynic put it, when you're... Uh, at an intersection and uh, your horn is stuck and you've got a gang of um, Hell's Angels motorcycle in front of you. That would, that would make a bad day, wouldn't it? <laughs> you would be, you'd know you'd be having a bad day when you try to pull that pair of pants on that you wore last spring and you couldn't get them above your knees. You know it would be going to be a bad day when you look in your calendar and it says, colonoscopy tomorrow, start prep. <laughs> All kidding aside, it's good to laugh. But life has its complications and challenges, doesn't it? We can all have bad days. And sometimes when we think it can't get worse, it does. Certainly the last year and a half of this pandemic has borne that out, hasn't it? When we thought things couldn't get worse, they have. The Apostle Paul knew what it was like to have a bad day. He had many of them too. But he knew his Savior and his Lord was with him. Even in the midst of the shipwrecks, the beatings, the imprisonments that he endured, he knew that his Lord had oversight of him and every aspect of his life. That is why he could write, and let's, I'm reading now from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessel, vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Now, Paul is talking about circumstances that come our way. And as a believer, what makes that different? He was one of those kind of people, as you read the story of the Apostle Paul, who was never under his circumstances. Someone asked, how are you doing? How are you doing? And we might answer, well, under the circumstances, I am, and we might proceed. But the Apostle Paul never stayed under his circumstances. He knew how to get on top of them. Whether shipwrecked or imprisoned in chains, his life was a testimony to the truth that we can be victors rather than victims. What was the Apostle Paul's secret? What was his secret? Well, he tells us that he knew the indwelling power of God in his own life. Christ lived within him 
And that made all the difference in the world for whatever he faced. Therefore, nothing on the outside was strong enough to crush him. Christ was his strength within. By faith in Jesus, he not only coped, but he also conquered. And the message for today is so can you and I. We can not only cope, but we can move on to conquering when we realize that opposition and adversity is a part of life. Is a part of life. Paul himself was wise enough to know that troubles are just a part of living. And sometimes those troubles we have and experience are a storm, a wicked storm. And sometimes it's not so stormy. Many of us think that life should always give us the wind at our back so that we can float through life seamlessly. We whimper when things don't go our way and we whine at at every setback. And I'm as bad as, as anyone else. But every once in a while, the Lord will catch you and challenge you. And today I'm hoping that God's word will grasp you. You see, if the currents against us are strong enough, many will throw up their hands and say, oh, well, it wasn't meant to be, I wasn't meant to succeed. But I remember one day, and I'm sure that this has happened to you as well. There was a bird in my yard building a nest. And work, they worked furiously at it. And, and boy, they put those things together, it seems, in no time. And when you ever look at them, it is amazing how they put them together. And that night, there was a, a strong wind. And in the morning when I came out, the nest was on the ground. And the bird was there. And what was the bird doing? He wasn't complaining. He wasn't whimpering or nothing. What was the bird doing? Collecting and putting the nest back together again. Get back at it. Try it again. What have you learned is what I used to always say to my children when things would go wrong. What did you learn? What will you do different? The first words of M. Scott Peck's helpful book, The Road Less Traveled, the first few words in that book are life is hard. Life is hard. It is hard. And the people who make the most significant contributions are the people who confront that truth head on. And they not only cope, but they conquer. They don't complain about it. They realize that's the way it is, and they try to make the best of it and move on. Do you know the story of Grandma Moses? Her name was Anna Marie Robertson. She worked early in her life as a hired girl on a farm. She met and married a hired hand on that farm, and his name was Tom Moses. They moved to a farm of their own. They raised 10 children. You can tell that was a while ago. Not too many have 10 children anymore. Anna loved to do needlework, but as she became older, her hands were stiffened with arthritis. And finally, at the age of 80, she could no longer handle the large, the, the large needle to embroider. So she tried to do something else. She started painting. She found she could handle a paintbrush more easily and began to uh, paint pictures, mostly farms and scenery, rural scenery. And one day, a New York City art collector came by town, and in the drugstore, he saw these pictures. And the rest, as they say, is history. Beginning after the age of 80 years, Grandma Moses painted over 1,500 paintings. 25% of her paintings were painted after she was 100 years old. She developed an international following. Why? Because her hands were stiffened up with arthritis and she couldn't embroider anymore. Life is hard. And only those who learn to confront that fact and plunge on with determination to move from coping to conquering. Secondly, we can move on to conquering when we realize that opposition and adversity often present opportunity. Often presents opportunity. 
I once read about a salesman who, who uh, was going into an elevator of a high rise to, to do sales calls and something happened in the elevator and he got stuck in it. Fortunately, he had a cell phone with him, phoned the fire department and they called us. Anyways, they were working on it to get him out. So he decided he's stuck here and what else to do? Instead of visiting with his clients, he phoned them all in the building, explained what was going on, closed some sales that day. Two and a half hours later, when they got him out of the elevator, he was done and went on to his, the rest of his business for the day. So there's a guy who knows the secret of not only coping, but conquering. Making the best of what you can with what you have and the situation you find yourself. As Henry Ford once said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Want me to say that again? Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. There's an eight-year-old boy, and he was quoted as saying, you know, I'm not old enough to play baseball yet. My mom told me, though, that when I do start to play ball, I'm not going to be able to run as fast as the other kids and get around the, the, the bases as quickly because I the operation I had. But I told mom that I didn't need to run so fast because when I play baseball, I'm just going to hit it out of the park. <laughs> then I'll be able to walk around the bases. You see, the Apostle Paul had within himself the indwelling power of God. He knew that God lived in him. And he knew that every form of opposition could be turned into an opportunity. And so when you find yourself in a situation that you did not plan on and things have happened not as you'd hoped, you need to say, Lord, what is it for me here to do? What would you like me to do now that it's this way? I don't like it this way. <laughs> That's me speaking now. I don't like it this way, but what am I going to do? When he was shipwrecked or imprisoned or delayed in his journeys, he used that opportunity to witness, to share the gospel, to do what he could where he was. Well, I can't go where I'm supposed to go or thought I was supposed to go. I guess I'm supposed to be here. I'll do what I thought I should do here. And many people come to know the Lord because of that. He knew that God would use those opportunities to cause the faith to sprout up, sprout up in unexpected places. Even while he was imprisoned, he wrote some of the loftiest words in all human literature that is found in the scriptures. If you know your work is from God, you don't give up just because you have been blown off course. If you know that God is with you and is a part of your life, you're not going to give up when you're blown off course. You need to trust and believe, God, this is where you want me. This is where you want me. Then I'll do something here. You assume that is where God means for you to be. And you go on doing what you believe God would have you to do. There's two cases that stand out in the life of this church that come to my mind. I think of Elvira Meyer. Some of you don't know her. Some of you may remember her. She ended up having to have an amputation below the knee. Now, if you know Elvira, as I did, and I'm not quoting her, but I assume she would have said something like, well, that sucks. <laughs> you have to know Elvira. You know? But she didn't stay there. She went on. She got a prosthesis. She was going to beat this thing. She was going to walk. And you know what happened? In the clinic, in the hospital where she was, in the floor that she was, the staff there used her to go to other much younger people. Elvira was not a, a, a young chicken at this point, like, you know. And uh, they would use her to go to other younger people who were having amputations to encourage them. And saying, look, if she can do it, you can do it. And she would encourage them. She was quite, a, quite an enthusiastic. And she did. She beat it. She walked. And, and, uh, and, and she, she, she tried to encourage others. I think of Sharan, Sharan Morash. Ten years or more with cancer. 
And she would have to sit many hours in the cancer clinic waiting for, for different procedures and things. And what would Sharan do? I remember her telling me she probably told you too what she would do. Well, I would talk to the people around me. I would try to be an encouragement to the staff, to other people, cancer patients. You would meet many people and just love them, just care for them and get the focus off yourself. She had a lot of problems. And yet she would, you know, if you know Sharan, right? That's what she would do. She would be smiling and cheery and talk to them and even tell them of Jesus if the Lord led her to do that. You see, opposition can become opportunities. It leads us to our final realization that opposition and adversity can transform us into a better person. It can transform us into a better person. For all of you who have had children, did it not change your life? <laughs> did it not change your life? Sure it does. And there's lots of challenge with raising children. And it changes you. That's what opposition does. That's what challenge does in your life. It changes you. And this is what Jesus' teaching on, the great, on a great life is all about. It's about taking what is useless and making it usable. Taking what is hopeless and making it hopeful. Taking what has been defeated and making it victorious. That's what the cross is all about. It looked like defeat. It looked like it was all over. The disciples were, were dejected and they thought it was all over, but it was only the beginning. It was to be some, the cross, the cruel cross, the cross of shame was to become a cross of glory and victory and overcoming of triumph. There's a, a story told of an ancient Asian monarch who owned a magnificent, large, perfect diamond. And it was the pride of the empire. But under some mysterious circumstances, it was damaged. And its beauty was marred by a, a long hair-like scratch on the diamond. And the king was devastated and heartbroken. He sent word throughout the kingdom that he would give an enormous reward to anyone who could repair this diamond. But no one came forward. All, all the best diamond cutters feared only failure. But then an artist, an artist stepped forward to rescue the diamond. And he said its greatest flaw shall be its most splendid glory. He announced this confidently. He took the diamond and he kept it in his possession for some time. And after, after a number of weeks went by, he returned it to the king and the king unveiled his precious stone and he held his breath. Perhaps the artist's had, hand had slipped. Perhaps now the stone would be worthless. Perhaps this artist was a, a fraud or a scoundrel. But slowly, carefully, the king unwrapped the diamond and catching a glimpse of the priceless treasure, he caught his breath for the artist had turned that hair-like flaw into the stem of an exquisite rose, an exquisite rose delicately carved into that diamond. And it was truly more beautiful than before. And you see, this is the story of the cross, the cross of Calvary, a symbol of shame, transformed through a means of salvation. It can be the story of your life. It can be the story of my life as well. We all face struggles. We all face hardship. We all face challenges. It comes in many, many forms. And our world right now continues to play out. And what's happening is affecting many lives with adversity and opposition to the life that we once knew. Things are different. Things have changed. We're not sure how it will be in the future. But by God's grace, our struggles and opposition can be turned into opportunity, can be changed into opportunity. I remember years ago, I wanted to learn how to use video and to get onto YouTube and, and put the message out there. And we even bought a camera here years ago. And you know, I never got around to it. Then all of a sudden the pandemic hit. <laughs> Did things ever change in a hurry, right? 
We couldn't have church. We couldn't get the message out. We had to very quickly learn how to do this. And I did and we did. It's not that we're creating television studio performances, but we're at least getting the message out. We're able to still function. Something bad, create something good. And I believe that when this pandemic is all over, there are going to be many lives that were changed in ways that they would never have been changed and for the good because they were challenged to move in a different direction. If nothing else, perhaps there'll be many who have drawn closer to the Lord. That is my prayer, that God will use this. The Apostle Paul discovered that in his weakness, he discovered the unmeasurable strength of God. As long as you believe and think that you can and you are able and you have the power and the strength, pardon my grammar, it ain't gonna work. But as God's people, believing and knowing that he dwells within you, and that all power and glory of, of all that exists can dwell within us. It is in our weakness when we are able to accomplish that God gets glory. That's how that works. And it's good news for our lives, is it not? We can not only cope, but we can conquer, knowing that God is in us, that God is walking with us, that he's taking us where he wants us to go and to be. We are frail and weak, an earthen vessel as pottery. Pottery, you know anything about pottery? It breaks real easy. <laughs> we are as pottery. And we can be broken. And yet, with Christ dwelling within us, we can come as durable as stainless steel. The proof of our weakness then shows the power of God in us. When we are able to get through, when, when others can see the peace that, that is ours. It's not that we were able to, 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 to create the peace, but it's God's peace within us through difficult and challenging and, and hard times. Christ is, is, is in us. He is our hope of glory. And this is the treasure that we hold within us. God is in us. He's not just around us. He's not just up in heaven. He actually comes to dwell in you. And that's what gives us the strength and the ability to get through all that we confront. That's the Christian message. That's the message of salvation. Our sin, he can clean it. He can wipe it away. He can forgive us. He can strengthen us, encourage us, and show us the way. There's nothing more needed in this world than to be forgiven. Forgiveness is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful medicine to know that you can be forgiven. It changes our lives. And we are, can only be forgiven because of the cross and what God himself did on that cross. He paid the price for sin. He paid the price for our sin. But he didn't leave it there. He didn't leave it there. He overcame death. He paid the price of it, but he overcame death. And because he overcame, we too can overcome. But more than that, more than that, he said, I would send you, I will send you, who? Who would he send? Spirit. Holy Spirit. God. God himself was going to come and be with us. He came as a man in Christ, and then he ascended into heaven, and then he would send God the Holy Spirit to be with us. Not only to be with us, but to be in us. There is our strength. There is our power. There is the hope we have. God in us. We're not on our own. You're not by yourself going through this pandemic. We're not as a society alone. God has not abandoned us. He is with us and he will help us. And if he decides it's time to take us from this world, then we who are his 
have the assurance that we will be with him. That we will be with him. What we see is not all there is. There's so much more to life. This is only a journey we're on. This is only part of the journey. God's desire is not for you to be on your own. He wants you to know that he loves you. He wants to help you to survive this journey. And he wants you to be victorious in this journey. And you only need to ask him. That is the most amazing, amazing message of the good news of Jesus. You only need to ask him and then believe in him. Be encouraged, my friends. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we live in a day and a time that is very hard right now. It truly is a storm in life right now. And there are many people that are having very great difficulty. But I pray for your people in the church, those who have committed their lives to you. May they grasp and understand the greatness of your salvation that you not only save us, but you live with us and within us to get us through all that we encounter. And no matter what we face, no matter what comes our way, and some of it is awfully, awfully hard and painful and difficult, and it can be fearful, but that is not your intent for us. You are with us. You will help us. You will show us new things. You must be pointing us in another direction. May we trust you for that, Lord. May we know that you are that kind of a God, loving and caring mm -hmm. for all your people. Bless them, help them. In these days, I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.